Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about anthropology and music with Johnny Clegg. Johnny Clegg is a former Grammy nominee who studied and taught Zulu dance and cultural anthropology at the University of Witwatersrand. Johnny has honorary doctorates from the City University of New York and Dartmouth College. Well, Johnny, if we could start with your professor days, when I believe you were called Jonathan back then. Yes. Uh, if you could say a word or two about your teaching load, what you were teaching, what books into, uh, affected you, and what books your students particularly liked. Um, going back to those days um, in, in South Africa, uh, we're talking about 1979 till 1983. I taught for four years, three years at the University of Witwatersrand, and one year at the University of Durban, um, Natal. Um, you. The, the higher education institutions were segregated, and so uh, a black student could only go to a white university if the black university did not offer the same course. And so uh, I began teaching um, a mainly um, white class of about ninety percent white students. Um, around about 300 in the first year as a, as, a, as a junior lecturer. And anthropology is a discipline where one has to basically um, decontaminate uh, people of, of, of all their, their racial and other cultural prejudices. And you can imagine how difficult that was in South Africa when you came out of a apartheid school uh, apartheid society, um, church, um, all, all the key civil uh, civil institutions being divided, and so the toughest, the, the, the new boys in town, all the newbies, who, who, who young lecturers who, who taught anthropology, uh, there was a baptism of fire, and what we had to do is we had to spend six weeks challenging all the racial and cultural prejudices of these young kids who just come out of school and into university. And so we did a course on race and racism. And um, we looked at genetics, we looked at culture, we looked at learned behavior, we looked at all the various ideas that people had. Uh, and, and the ideas that the government was promoting, um, wanting to separa separate the races, finding, uh, looking for uh, pseudo-scientific uh, justifications to do this. Um, so we had to deal with a lot of a lot of things which were generally outside the purview of strict anthropology. Uh, it, it was it was a um, a difficult sort of even for the students baptism of fire because every every call every lecture forty five minutes um, would be you know putting putting these ideas and putting them emotionally on the in the firing line. But why would the authorities, the apartheid authorities, allow this? Basically, um, you know, they, they had no control over the curriculum. They, as much control as they could leverage, they would. But, and they would do that at, at the higher levels of the administration, looking at funding, uh, seeing, you know, where they could squeeze the university if the university was, it was um, operating, you know, in a way that wasn't helpful to them. Um, but the University of Witwatersrand, Witz, was, was a hotbed of, of, of protest and rebellion. You know, it's uh, historically was a, um, through, the, through the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, so one of the, one of the things which uh, one, one, one had to um, deal with was, was there would be people who um, obviously would fall away and fall out and were, were um, challenged by what we were saying and um, we would then move on to other uh, courses because I, I, I uh, as, as, a, as you became a, a, I think in the second year I was allowed to introduce courses which I found interesting 
Um, uh, we did a course on anthropology of war, um, anthropology of dance, and semiotics, um, symbolism, uh, signs, um, and uh, mythology, how, how, how societies construct their worldview and, and how they symbolize um, this experience of their world uh, into, into legends, mythologies, into um, uh, poetry, uh, praise poetry, or other kinds of things. So it was for me. It was a very, very um, uh, interesting period because I I was a musician. I had been writing and breaking all the cultural segregation rules prior to be entering university. I had uh, discovered Zulu street guitar music when I was fifteen, and that led me into the migrant labour hostels around Johannesburg. And um, I kind of joined a group of people who were very generous and open and allowed this little white boy to come in and learn um, to play guitar in Constantina and uh, later uh, Zulu war dancing. So um, I, you know, I was arrested when I was 15 or 16. Uh, I, you know, I, had, I had a lot of problems with authorities. So I wasn't teaching from the perspective of an academic ivory tower um, angle. Um, I, I, I was not really in the flow of the idea of you know the pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake, because I could see that this knowledge was actually based in a society that had been corrupted by incredibly um, disadvantageous ideas. And it was ideas, knowledge, in fact, that was finding a justification for them outside the university in the apartheid ideology. And they they took they took um, they they tried to interpret parts of the Bible. Uh, they tried to interpret certain ideas about um, the um, the paleontological evidence. Uh, in fact, there was an American. Um, I think his his name was uh, Dr. Carlton Kuhn who published a book which was really well received in South Africa, where he argued that um, uh, the, 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 the split between uh, the, the various um, homo sapiens that had been found, uh, Peking man, Neanderthal man, and Australopithecus Africanus in, in South Africa, was actually um, a kind of a biological justification for splitting the races, because uh, you, here you had you had you know, different um, the species, a speciation happening. So, so they tried to, to to bring all the pseudoscience into into justifying apartheid. So, um, I I was very aware that knowledge has an interest base, and I was um, keen when I started to teach to try and um, teach things which I which I felt. Um, competent and, and interested in because I believe that if you teach with passion, if if a course really interests you, you will pass that on to your students. They will engage and they will um, feel the, your your the importance um, and and the and, and the, the meaning of, 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 of the information that, that you're trying to impart. Well and how did your students and, and other faculty members relate to you when you left the academy to sing full time? Well, I had been singing full time. I had um, my first album was released in 1979 when I became an anthropologist. And um, it was on my fourth album that I got a top 40 hit in England. And I went to see my, my, the head of my department and I said, Look, you know, I've been doing this music way long before I did anthropology. And, um, you know, I've, I've been banned on the radio, I've been uh, restricted, I've had my shows closed down by the police, you know. There's no career here for me in, in what I'm doing in a way, you know, and, and it would be great if I could have a chance to see how, how it would develop overseas. So, can I have a sabbatical? And he said, Jonathan, the moment you walk out that door, we'll never see you again. And I said, no, 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 I'll be back. But he was right, I only went back for a cup of tea and a chat. Uh, and I, from time to time, I was invited to come back and, and, and talk on certain things that they felt, um, uh, if they were doing a course on music or dance or 
um, praise poetry or something, you know, I, I would come as a guest and, and, and give one little talk, you know. So I used to do a lot of that as well. Uh, and I enjoyed teaching. Um, I think uh, uh, teaching is a, is a very, um, as, as a deeply rewarding uh, profession, it's a vocation. Um, when you have spent that 45 minutes connecting it's a matter of, it's like an audience when you play, when you connect with your student body, and especially if you're growing with them and you're going to the second year and the third year and you're building mm -hmm. that. It's a very powerful thing that you feel as a teacher. Uh, there's, a, there's a body of knowledge that is being built upon brick and brick and brick, building and building. And that incredible reward when you see them articulating it and taking it further or taking it in this direction mm -hmm. or that direction. So uh, that, 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 that has always been a, um, uh, a feeling that I've had of, of a certain kind of a loss, not being able to have completed my career as a, you know, gone and do my PhD and, and all that stuff, uh, and, 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 and watched other um, students, you know, carry on either as anthropologists or to go off to do something. I never really had the, 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 the pleasure of seeing um, People haven't gone through my whole course three years or so, and and gone off to do something and come back and to see that because that's also um, um, it's like a homing pigeon, you know, you throw it up and it flies, you know, and then one day it comes back. <laughs> but in some ways, your music is like that as well. Yes, there's been a, it's been replaced in a way, but I, I think also when you um, when you are teaching in an environment where you have um, powerful social cleavages and um, a, a, you know, a political system that is so oppressive, um, you, 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 the, the, uh, when you are in the, the lecture or theatre, it becomes a, a, a daily task to suspend your disbelief because mm -hmm. you enter this forum which is the forum of knowledge but outside there, there's so much going on and, and you know that the people that, that you're teaching are there by the grace of an apartheid system which says only whites can go to this university all of that you have to deal with on a daily basis and so you get you, uh, it, it's it emotionally it's quite hard if you are a thinking person if you are if you are just um, an administrator or you are you know teaching a subject which you know, you're just doing mechanically that's fine you know you you probably sail through that but um, I know that in the social sciences the psychologists the political science African government social anthropology history uh, English uh, languages um, Classical life and thought, all of those, that little group of, of, of the arts, they, they went through personal crises because they were teaching stuff as if they were in a vacuum and outside we had this terrible situation. And so more and more we found that if you were teaching classical life and thought, somebody would take something about the history of Rome, which was similar to what was going on to South Africa, and they would bring it in because that made you feel more comfortable about what you're doing. And a lot of a lot of um, the, the 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 social sciences, I would say, you know, ninety percent of them became quite radicalized, and we were reading, you know, um, very very um, provocative papers and and uh, thought-provoking positions on religion, on the role of education, you know, uh, what, what, is a, what, is a, what is a curriculum? You know, how, how um, uh, devilish and diabolical you can be in the way you structure a curriculum so that people actually don't come out with an education because you want to subjugate them. Um, so, uh, you know, w w we, we were all, uh, at that time, in a, in a time of incredible foment, not just socially and in the wider social framework, but internally. And we used to argue a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, my colleague, uh, who was my um, senior, uh, who encouraged me to become an anthropologist, Dr. David Webster, 
became so radicalized and so um, um, emotionally distraught about teaching in this environment that he had to do something outside the university and he started the, the DPSC which is the detainees support um, uh, detainees parents support committee and what he would do is that he would monitor which young activist had been uh, caught by the security police and um, interned and then disappeared so you would hear that oh this young this young activist was arrested in Soweto and he was uh, booked in at Protea police station but they can't find him there where he is so David started this and it really upset the security police because what he would do is he had these tea parties and he'd invite all the embassies and he would get um, all the governments from around the world and he'd say these you know, these 500 people they have disappeared we later discovered that three quarters of them were murdered by the security police so in 1989 he was shot dead outside his house by the security police he was assassinated and um, this particular moment uh, was a galvanizing moment because he, you know he, he was he, he was being at, at times some of the academics felt that you know if you want to be a political activist go and be a political activist if you want to be an academic you can be an, uh, um, an activist academic um, by provoking thought and provoking ideas and creating uh, a fertile ground for people to challenge what's going on, but at the level of ideas, because that's what you are, you're an academic, you're a university institution. If you want to go out into and fight the real sensuous political engagement, then you must do that. So at times he was isolated because the university, some people in the university felt that this was the wrong way to go. When he was assassinated, it was a galvanizing moment which united us all. And um, I remember this funeral in the, um, in the church downtown, um, people got up and actually apologized. Um, I mean, uh, said, you know, we were, David has opened the road, he showed the way, we, you know, we, we, we never realized that, um, you know, these things were going on like this and that, whatever, whatever. So it was, a, it, it was being an academic in South Africa uh, was very different to how academics w w were configured elsewhere in the world. Being a teacher, you had, you had, you had a, a greater role to play than simply imparting ideas because you were doing it at a time where you had to not only impart ideas but give people f food and nourishment to engage in the wider struggle of the country and to help them develop a position where they could um, be progressive and find a, a, an angle for themselves with whatever they were going to go do when they left the university. And so that was just an added thing and um, because I'd come out of a, a, a cultural struggle as a youngster into the university, I was known by young students and I was known by you know the uh, university um, uh, colleagues as having, in my own way, engaged in my own little struggle to get just to sing English and Zulu on the same song uh, because of the the, the censorship laws, the uh, cultural segregation on radio, etc. That my shows had been closed down by the police. We'd been tear, tear gassed and you know dogs and um, and. Um, but the fact that we had also got a lot of support from the migrant workers and from the student body and I've been building up this, this following by playing live. Um, so it was a, it was a, and, and then of course uh, there was a, a, um, another layer inside the university where, where there was a, a, a very big um, debate going on about uh, political engagement inside the university. How does that work? And where do you draw the boundaries? Um, you know, what is the difference between a critically reflective analysis of South Africa 
and propaganda. What's the difference? You know what I'm saying? So those debates were happening in the tea room. That's where the stuff, the real stuff was going down. People were getting very hot under the collar and saying, you know, if I'm going to teach history, I want to teach history. I understand that history in South Africa or something has happened in a context, but I have to have a certain distance so that I can, you know, as, 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 a, as a thoughtful person, be able to put the parts together, you know. I'm not going to promote simply because I feel emotionally and um, overwhelmed by guilt to, to, to promote a particular position so that um, political parties outside of the university are going to benefit or the struggle is going to benefit in some way. And I had the same debates inside the cultural groupings that, that we that used to meet where we used to discuss the idea of culture as a weapon of struggle. Now, the moment that you turn culture into a weapon, you have a problem. Uh, you, 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 you are um, involved, again, you've got to be very careful there of not be, becoming just a propagandist for a political, political position, which itself is going to change after time because, as we know, politics changes, um, different groups come in, different ideas develop, and then suddenly you are, you are fighting for this, and now that 10 years later they've got a complete uh, exact opposite. Uh, position, so you know you you feel betrayed because you know right in the beginning you were fighting for this and and now it's changed. So we had we 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 had very sophisticated debates around how can, how to be a progressive cultural um, activist. Uh, where do you draw the line? How do you keep your sense of freedom? How do you keep your the freedom for your own creativity? The right to even criticize the liberation movement to say the liberation movement is making mistakes. Um, there was big pressure not to do that. Right, and, I, and that certainly exists today as well. How do you advise students who are now in university who are dealing with some of these issues but in perhaps less of a life-threatening situation than you were dealing with in South Africa? Well, um, I think that, you know, um, there was a very famous um, German philosopher called Jürgen Habermas. He published a book called Knowledge and Human Interest. And he was, he was, he was in this book trying to show that all knowledge has an agenda. All knowledge actually is, there is a, there is a political power component to it in the sense that um, even uh, um, technical things, highly technical things, they have a technical interest because, it, because you're going to be promoting maybe a certain technical direction instead of another technical direction. So it means that you've taken, you've taken sides and by taking sides you're promoting an interest group who, who, who are putting, you know, who are promoting something. So all knowledge has an interest base. All knowledge has some connection to an agenda. I think the first thing is, is that you have to as a student, you have to understand how that works. Um, if you, and then you have to be open, say, you know what, I want to promote, or I feel that uh, morally or um, just rationally, this is the best possible um, uh, platform or, 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 or way to go forward. And I think that this model and this approach to understanding unemployment, education, curricula, whatever it is, is the best one that enables us to look at all the issues and see where the interest lies. Um, it, for, for a student to get to that point, it was um, hard for me in the beginning as a student uh, because we were being, uh, you know, I remember the people arguing because I did politics as well. I, I, I finished three years of politics. I uh, did a double major in uh, anthropology and politics. So I had a very, very strong politi political philosophy background as well. Uh, and in the beginning, I, you know, I, I actually I balked at the idea that all knowledge has got an interest base because 
you know, in the end, at the end of the first year, you know, they, they had persuaded me that pure mathematics has got an interest base. That by choosing certain kinds of ways to solve, you are supporting a, 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 an intellectual tradition that's coming from here and not one that's coming from here. And so these ideas, what we call um, uh, traditions of knowledge or traditions of academia, whether it's you know, Bertrand Russell or whatever it is, or, or, or idealism or materialism, whatever it is, those, that's what we call interest. That, that is the interest base of your, because you, you've aligned yourself to a way of thinking. And by aligning, now all I'm saying is that students must know that, and they must, if they must consciously say, well, I want to align myself here. And I will make it clear to everybody, so everybody knows. I'm aligned to this position, and I have rational and good reasons to align myself to this. And I will carry on, and that's what I'm going to go on with. So that, that, was a, that took me a long time to understand. Well, I wonder if, if now, when, you're, when you perform, if somebody in the audience could say, I like Johnny Clegg's music, but I don't like his political ideas. All the time. Happens all the time. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I am... <coughs> What I do, when I'm on stage or when I talk, I try as much as possible. Uh, my old professor, Hammond Took, uh, as, as anthropologists, our, our methodology is participant observation. Uh, an anthropologist who hasn't done a year, at least a year of field work, going to live in a community to generate uh, a body of, of, of experience and knowledge, living with the people, learning the language, understanding, participating, and observing. Um, that anthropology hasn't done that. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, he's, he's, not, he's not really accepted in the community as having you know, gone through the, you know, the, 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 the baptism of fire. Um, and so uh, my professor always said to me that a good, solid description just as the best way you could describe an event or a situation is better than theorizing about it. Because the description is, is actually making clear and putting on the table the, all the parts of the equation. Theory comes in and says, no, this part must go here, this part goes like that, and that part goes. But it's the, the guy who brings the description. You know, it's like, you can't play a solo unless you have a song to play the solo against. Unless you've got the parts, the chords, and the rhythm. You can't play a solo. And you can't make a theoretical um, you know, uh, set of ideas unless you've got the stuff that you're theorizing about accurate. So a good description, a good accurate description is the best building block. And so on stage, I describe things. I use that idea, I say. I just describe things uh, and, and, and tell stories and anecdotes uh, about, the, you know, about the, why I wrote the song. And what comes out of those descriptions is people start to understand other things about Sulu culture or politics in South Africa or the way people dress or how, how music changes, how people change the cuisine why this came in and that came in and you know so uh, and that I enjoy I enjoy that part of what I do on stage and you do it really well and we would like to thank you so much for coming on the show Johnny Clegg thank you thanks a lot for additional information about Johnny Clegg please visit johnnyclegg.com if you have comments about higher education today please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.